I think it's a, a nice outlook and it's nice to be able to talk about the industry back in profitability uh, given you know the horrible times we've gone through over the past few years. A lot of hard work, um, still a lot of challenges to face but you know we're cautiously optimistic about the outcome for 2023 and indeed beyond into 2024. When you talk about uh, you know forecast profitability of 9.8 billion, that sounds like a huge well, it is a huge figure. But when you look at it in terms of uh, the margin on revenues of 803 million, you know it's a it's a net margin of 1.2 percent, uh, and and this is very very small. You know we talk about uh, an average of two dollars twenty five for a passenger carried. Somebody said this morning wouldn't even get you half a cup of coffee in Geneva. So uh, you know it's it's nice that we're back in profitability. But the levels of profitability are still wafer thin. So there is a lot of work to do, particularly given the damage that was done to balance sheets and the airlines through the period of the uh, pandemic. I think the frustration we have now is that the uh, issues are primarily outside of our control, uh, is spare parts. Um, you know, this is really frustrating for airlines that they can't keep the fleet that they have in operation going because they're waiting on parts. While airlines and airports were, I think, fairly criticised last year for not having resources in place, that issue has been addressed. But we now see air traffic control resources not at the level that would be required. And then the ongoing frustration with air traffic control strikes in France. So, you know, there are challenges there and uh, disappointing to see that uh, these will impact on performance and it will be frustrating for our, our customers in uh, 2023. Um, but I suppose what we have to do is recognise that at least airlines, you know, did address the uh, challenges that they faced. We, we now just want others to play their part as well. Schiphol, it's been a disaster when you consider the, the impact that they had on airlines flying into the Netherlands and customers. Uh, and, you know, they've no shame. Uh, they, they're still arguing that they need more money. Uh, now, you know, airlines don't mind paying for service, but when you're paying way above the odds and not getting the service, it's just completely unacceptable. Uh, so Schiphol, I have to be honest, has been hugely disappointing, but they're not alone. Uh, we have seen other areas of the world push for big increases. We're not getting the service that we should be getting. Delays have increased uh, beyond you know, what you would expect. Environmental targets have not been met. So uh, very frustrating for us to have to uh, you know, encounter these increases. We've got to call them out. You know, we've got to shine the spotlight on the people who aren't performing and we've got to continue to encourage governments to recognise that in these cases strong economic regulation is required. Uh, we don't see competition between airports. Uh, they act as uh, monopolies or quasi-monopolies. Uh, we don't see commercial behaviour that you would normally see. So in the absence of uh, a competitive market, economic regulation is required and we will continue to push for effective economic regulation and to highlight those that are you know, not performing in the way that they should. I think when we see the way the consumer rights uh, has developed in Europe, uh, EC261 or EU261, uh, it's gone way beyond what was ever intended because it's been interpreted by courts. And now you have individual judges making determinations as to what an exceptional, uh, exceptional circumstance is. I think what regulators don't often understand is they, they, don't, they don't come for free. You know, the idea that people are getting compensated uh, just adds to the cost base of the airline and if the cost base is inflated because of inefficient regulation that's ultimately getting passed back to the consumer. So the consumer isn't benefiting from this and what's even more frustrating is when airlines are having to compensate for problems completely outside of their control. Uh, so the, you know, it, it was disappointing to see the US say that they're going to model their consumer uh, protection legislation on the EU when the issue in the US is air traffic control, uh, which has nothing to do with airlines and everything to do with the US government. It is an area that we, we have to push back on. Um, difficult to see how we can get individual countries to align, but that doesn't mean we should stop and accept what uh, we're seeing at the moment. We have to start by identifying where the problem uh, lies. We have to uh, ensure that we uh, point out to these regulators 
where the problem exists and to deal with the problem. So if you think of Europe, you know, this idea that compensation would ultimately lead to a better performing industry, we've, we've seen no reduction in delays or cancellations. So what we've got to do is try and make sure that people understand that you know, where airlines are at fault, we should be expected to look after our customers. But where that fault lies elsewhere, then the penalty should apply to the cause of the problem, not just to automatically assume that it's the airline at fault. I think the first thing we do is point out that it is the only way that our industry is going to get to 2050. There's no alternative to using SAF. Now, it's not just SAF that will get us there, but it is this most significant contribution to the abatement that will be necessary to achieve net zero. And therefore, we want everybody to play their part in that. Airlines have signaled very strongly that they will use SAF where it's available, despite the increase in cost. So we've used every single drop that has been produced. What we need now is we need governments to provide the, the policy framework and the incentives to see greater production of SAF in exactly the same way as they assisted the transition to low energy, uh, low carbon uh, sources in, in other segments of the economy. So we're not asking to be treated in a special way, we're just asking to be treated in the same way as everybody else. But I would argue this is an opportunity because uh, production of sustainable aviation fuel is a new industry that will sustain jobs, new jobs, and it means you're, you're no longer dependent on importing crude oil or refined oil because you can produce it in your own country. So you don't need to have oil in the ground, uh, you know, which uh, it should be seen as a you know, fantastic opportunity for uh, countries and governments right across the world. I think we need to be seen uh, to be taking action to support the words. You know, we've committed to net zero in 2050. When we made that commitment uh, two years ago now, uh, we presented a roadmap. And I was very clear in saying it was a roadmap, if not the roadmap. There will be other opportunities. But I think what people want to see now is action to support the words. Yeah, I think the words have been very welcomed. They want to see action. And therefore, we need to be able to measure the progress that we're making. And in measuring the progress, we need to be able to identify what more can be done and who needs to do it. You know, it's not just about airlines. Uh, we need everybody to be playing their part. So now is the time to demonstrate that the action has been taken that can give people confidence that we are on the right trajectory to get to net zero in 2050. It's an area we have to be very careful. We have to really understand that what we say is going to be challenged by people. There are, uh, you know, there are groups out there who don't want to see us succeed. Uh, you know, would would love to see us fail. Uh, and what we've got to do is, you know, not give ammunition to these people to be able to be critical of us. Hence, the reason I, I think having credible pathways to net zero is important. Not to make promises that can't be delivered. Not to overstate the performance, to be honest about the challenges. And I think we have been honest about the challenge, you know, and, and to make sure that the words we use are, that we're careful in our choice of words, uh, that we can't be uh, accused of misleading consumers or regulators. Uh, and therefore, you know, it's, it's a new area, but I, I think airlines are becoming much more aware of, uh, you know, the responsibility that they have in relation to this. I'm really pleased with the progress that we're making uh, and it just demonstrates you know what gets measured gets done. Uh, so we've got to continue on the path to not just meeting the target that we set for 2025 but hopefully to exceed that and then look at what the next target is. The job is not done uh, and there's still areas uh, within the industry where female representation is very very low. Uh, you know technical areas, engineers, mechanics, pilots we need to uh, do a lot more. Now, it's a long-term journey uh, and expecting you know, change overnight you know, would be foolish because we have to ensure that we have the right frameworks in place to support this. But I, I'm very encouraged. I would like to think that some of the challenges that we've identified that are outside of our control uh, will be addressed. Uh, I don't expect them to be resolved fully because some of these will take time. Uh, I would like to see, and I believe we will, progress on the road to net zero in 2050. Uh, much greater understanding and awareness of what it is we need to do, 
but importantly, what everybody else needs to do to ensure that the industry can be successful.